Did you know that 90% of bad property decisions are caused by the same five mistakes? After working on thousands of property deals, I started to notice a pattern. Anytime an investor messed up and lost a load of money, it tended to be due to a basic mistake that they made in the process. And with the right information, these mistakes could easily have been avoided. So in this video, I'm going to explain what these five mistakes are and how you can avoid them to make more money from your investments. And at the end, I'll explain how you can actually turn these common mistakes into investment opportunities. So let's get started with the first mistake, which happens way before anyone's even visited the property. So you manage to save up £50,000, you invest in a quality property with the help of a mortgage, and congratulations, you are one of the elite few who can call themselves a property investor. But there's a problem. You're far from wealthy yet. Your life doesn't feel any different and you've spent all the cash you had to invest. So let's imagine that property generates a return on investment of 10% per year, which is really pretty high. Even so, based on the 50,000 pounds you invested, that equates to 400 pounds per month before tax. Don't get me wrong, I'd rather have 400 pounds than not have 400 pounds, but it's hardly enough to justify flicking through the pages of which yacht magazine. Of course, you'd also expect that property to grow in value, but even so, you're looking at the best part of a decade before it's anything to write home about. Of course, if you'll have another £50,000 saved up in another year or two, so you can keep on repeating the trick, eventually that yacht might become a reality. But for most people, it'll take years and years and years to save up that amount. So even if you didn't go into property thinking it was a get rich quick scheme, the speed of your progress is still gonna be frustratingly slow. The same goes for flipping properties. If you do extremely well, you might make a 20% return on your money, which in this case would be 10,000 pounds, which is great. Again, better to have than not, but it could easily take you a year to complete that project, release the cash and find the next one. So once again, you have a stressful extra job and not much of a change in lifestyle to show for it. This doesn't mean you've done anything wrong and it's not anything to be upset about. The nature of property is that it plays out over a long, long period of time. The problem is unrealistic expectations. In my experience, people don't have enough of an understanding of the numbers. They don't appreciate just how capital intensive property investment is. Unless you're able to feed it with large amounts of cash consistently, or you're willing to wait a long time, or preferably both, your results will be unimpressive. There are ways to put in more effort, take on a bit more risk, and speed up your progress. The most common way of doing this is what's known as the buy, refurbish, refinance strategy, where you buy a property, increase its value, then remortgage based on the higher value. As a result, after using the new mortgage to pay back your original loan, you still have cash in the bank, which you can put towards your next property. If executed perfectly, this means you could recycle the same deposit over and over again to build up a large portfolio without running out of money. In practice, it's virtually impossible to execute perfectly, but even if you just pull half of your money back out, that would halve the time it takes you to save up for your next one. So it's always something to consider. Imagine someone who's obsessed with watching cooking shows on TV. They have all the recipe books and they've ordered all the fancy equipment that they see top chefs recommend. But all that equipment has never been taken out of its packaging and they're still on first name terms with their delivery driver. However much they learn, they can't bring themselves to go into the kitchen until they're convinced they found the absolute perfect recipe and they've learned everything there is to know so they can cook the dish perfectly on their first try. That sounds crazy in this context, but you see people do it with property all the time. I know people who've listened to our podcast since it first started 10 years ago and they still haven't managed to invest. Now this is not entirely irrational, it's a great show and the jokes are fantastic, but if I'm honest I know that's not why they're listening. They want the potentially life-changing benefits of investing in property but they can't overcome what we call analysis paralysis. They're waiting for three things to line up perfectly. First they're waiting for the perfect time to invest, a time when there are absolutely no worries about what might happen in the future. No uncertainty around government policy, the economy is looking strong, house prices are guaranteed to keep going up, but of course that day never arrives. Secondly, they're waiting for the perfect property to come along that has no downsides whatsoever. It's next door to a train station, but it's quiet. It's old and has character, but there are no faults with it. It's perfect in every way, and yet no one else is interested in it for some reason, so they can grab it at a bargain price. Again, you could look forever, but the perfect deal doesn't exist. And thirdly, they're waiting until they have all the knowledge. They can't possibly make a mistake 
because they've learned through books, podcasts, YouTube, everything there is to know about property. And you can, through these sources, learn just about everything there is to know. The amount of information out there is astonishing compared to when I started. But here's the problem. You can only learn it in the abstract. The most powerful learning in anything comes from doing. You'll learn more from doing your first property deal than you could do in five years of learning the theory. And analysis paralysis is a tricky one to overcome because unlike baking a cake with a soggy bottom, the consequences of making mistakes in property can be quite serious. So the answer is not to just get over yourself and go for it straight away. There is a happy medium because there's another mistake that can turn out to be very expensive. Everyone loves a deal. So it's no surprise that Black Friday is becoming more of an event in the UK every year. When November comes around, our inboxes get flooded with fantastic offers and thousands of products have their prices slashed. But the bargains aren't always as attractive as they first appear. In fact, an investigation by which found out that 98% of products that were on sale on Black Friday had been cheaper than their sale price at some point during the year already. What happens is retailers increase their prices in the months leading up to Black Friday so they can then reduce them again and claim you're getting a bargain. If you're a dedicated shopper, there are tools you can use to track these prices and make sure you really are getting a deal. And lots of people do this when they buy a blender or a TV, but for some reason, not when they buy a property and they walk straight into the Black Friday trap. If a property is advertised with an asking price of 200,000 pounds and they manage to agree a price of 190,000, they are delighted with themselves about the hard bargain they've driven. But who's to say that the property is worth 200,000 pounds in the first place? It's just as possible that it's actually worth 180,000 pounds and in fact, you've just overpaid. All around the UK, this lack of research is literally costing investors tens of thousands of pounds every day. Another common mistake is to go on right move, sort price by low to high, and then be delighted when you find a property that's marketed for sale substantially cheaper than all the others. Could it be that this seller is just in a serious hurry to sell and is willing to accept a low price? Well, it might be that their pricing is somewhat more realistic than others, but if it's that much of a bargain, it won't have made it onto the internet in the first place. One of the estate agent's preferred buyers will have been offered it instead. If the price is that much lower, there will be something wrong with it, whether it's a short lease, a structural issue, a dispute, or something more sinister, which is why this next part is so important. So you've overcome all the potential obstacles so far. You've built a realistic plan that will get you where you need to be. You've convinced yourself to take action and you've done your research to make sure that the property is a good one at the right price. Now it's time to find a tenant. And at this point, investors can often make one of two mistakes. One is that they just hand the keys over to a local letting agent and be done with it. The problem here is you then have no idea whether they're doing a good job or not. Have they followed the right legal processes? Are the quotes they're giving you for repairs reasonable? And have they put the right tenant into the property in the first place. You really don't know. You might get lucky or you might not. The other mistake, and probably the more common one, is to take a look at the big chunk that a letting agent's fees would take out of their profit and think, well, it can't be that hard. I'll just do it myself. Maybe you even know someone whose daughter is looking for a place to rent, which is fantastic because it saves the cost of advertising. And with a bit of Googling, you blag your way through the process of setting up the tenancy. But what happens when the rent doesn't arrive one month and then again the next? Not only have you got a very awkward situation with your friend, but when you decide enough is enough, and you tried to take action through the courts, you realized that you didn't serve certain documents or you didn't protect the tenant's deposit. So the courts won't help you and there's not much you can do. The reality is property lettings and management isn't that hard. All the information about what you need to do and how to do it is out there for free. But a common mistake is to go into the process far too lightly. What investors often don't realize is that when you're issuing a tenancy, what you're actually doing is giving your tenant a set of legal rights that supersede your own. They have more rights to the property than you do, including the right to prevent you from entering at all, except under very specific circumstances. And after answering thousands of questions over the years on our podcast and in our newspaper column, I'd say that yes, of course, some investors do get unlucky and have bad situations, but a solid 80% of issues could have been avoided if they just spent a little bit of time building their knowledge. But this final mistake is something that all investors need to understand. Otherwise the rest is all for nothing.
In 2021, property prices were flying. People were still in the post-pandemic mindset of spending lots of time at home and looking to maybe move out of the city. People also had lots of savings because they had nothing to spend money on. So everyone was looking to move. If you called an agent about a property, you'd be lucky to get a call back because they'd already have 10 other viewings booked in. And if you got as far as making an offer, you'd be up against other buyers who'd bid the price up like crazy. This was a pain if you were trying to buy a family home, but great news if you were an investor because all this activity was pushed up the value of properties you already owned. And during this time, I didn't hear from anyone who was even thinking about selling one of their properties. Why would you when times are so good? But then of course, at some point in the late summer of 2022, the market started to turn. We had the infamous mini budget fiasco, mortgage rates flew up and property prices started to fall. And as prices started to fall, we started to hear from more and more listeners who wanted to sell properties and were wondering if it was a good time. And the answer was, no, of course it's not a good time. All those people who were packing out viewings just six months earlier had vanished. Now you'd be lucky to find a buyer at all. And if you did, it certainly wouldn't be at the price you were hoping for. Granted, some of these wannabe sellers were in that situation because their mortgage rate had increased and their investment wasn't as attractive anymore. But I also heard from plenty of people who owned their properties outright and still wanted to sell because they'd realized that property wasn't guaranteed to just always go up and up. But here's the thing, by trying to buy when everyone else is trying to buy, then suddenly wanting to sell when activity has died off, you're fighting against the market. And the difference this makes to your results can be enormous. Just imagine you're selling a property into a hot market and you attract two buyers who both desperately want the property. They could end up bidding the price up by 10% which on a £200,000 property, of course, is £20,000. But if you lose faith and instead try to sell into a cold market, you might need to take a hit of 10% instead. And finding any buyer at all could take six months, during which time you potentially don't have any rental income and you've got all your normal costs. Add it all up and that is tens of thousands of pounds of difference, as well as being a major strain on your cash flow. So now we understand these five mistakes, what can we do to avoid them? Well, the first is to avoid unrealistic expectations by setting out a property investment business plan. This doesn't have to be hundreds of pages long. It's just to make sure you're going in with eyes open about what you can realistically achieve. And in fact, the simpler, the better. Half a page setting out year by year how much cash you think you'll be able to put in, what returns you'll be likely to get, and what that will ultimately mean for you in terms of your target goal is plenty. And in the description of this video, we'll share a template to help you put this together. The next step is to stop looking at numbers and start looking at yourself. Based on what you know about yourself from your life so far, are you more likely to rush in and make some rash mistakes or not act at all and fall victim to analysis paralysis? Just being aware of where you typically fail can help you to catch yourself in the moment as you go along. But whichever one it is for you, I suggest setting yourself a deadline. If you're the impulsive type, make that a deadline of say six months before you allow yourself to invest and use that time for doing your research and building your knowledge. Or if you're an overanalyzer, make that a deadline of six months after which you decide, okay, I know everything I need to know, now I'm gonna get out and start taking action. And as you do this, don't make the mistake of those Black Friday shoppers. Do your research so you know what a good deal looks like and what price you should be paying. The method to use is exactly the same one the professional surveyors do when they're giving valuations. Look up similar properties nearby that have sold recently. You can find this information on the land registry or by going to Rightmove and looking for house prices in the top menu. Obviously, the ideal situation will be finding an identical house next door that sold last week. In reality, it's never that precise. So the further you go out in terms of similarity, geography and time, the more cautious you have to be about the accuracy of your estimates. Another problem is that it takes months for price data from sales to appear, during which time the market could have moved. So look on Rightmove for properties that are listed for sale now and tick the box to see those that are sold subject to contract. If you see one that's comparable, give the agent a call and ask them what price it's sold for. Depending on how you approach the conversation and how lucky you get, they may or may not tell you, but you'll normally learn something in the conversation that you can use to refine your estimate. But the most important thing you can do is have a mindset shift where you forget that the asking price even exists. Because the danger is it could anchor you to a price so you assume that the real value can't be that far off. But in fact, it could have been plucked completely from the air. And while it might feel awkward to start your offer as much as 20% below it, if that's the value, 
that's the value. Next, start to think about how you'll handle the management of the property before you buy it, so you're not suddenly rushed into a decision under pressure. Just a few hours of building up your knowledge here can make all the difference. I've written a book called How To Be A Landlord, which for 12 quid will take you through the entire process from start to finish, so you can have a speed read through to see what's in store, and then come back and study particular sections as you encounter them. Or you can find all the information you need for free on the government website, and consider joining a landlord association, where for a small annual fee, you'll have access to their templates and an advice service. And as you do all this, keep in mind what the wider market is like. If the market is cold and sentiment is negative, don't be put off investing. This is probably when the best opportunities will be around. And if the market is hot, don't get swept up in it. Don't rush because it can derail your entire investment plan before you even start. And in truth, this is probably the hardest thing to do as an investor because another mistake people make consistently throughout the property investment process is to get emotionally involved. It's hard not to because the numbers are big and intimidating and property is very personal. It's easy to end up getting emotionally involved with tenant issues and finding the whole process more stressful than it would be if you were looking at it objectively. It's easy to get swept up in the excitement of a booming market and letting go of all your careful criteria in the race to secure a property and convince yourself it actually might be worth that 10,000 pounds more after all. But the best way to avoid that is to stick to a process. If you have a standard way of assessing a property opportunity and a standard set of figures you look for, then the numbers don't lie. If it's not adding up, you know it's not right and you need to walk away. So to help you do that, check out the free spreadsheet in the description that will help you assess any property investment opportunity. And check out this video where we walk you through how to use it step by step.